boots and stuff. So I hear y'all's conversation discussing boots and sandals, apparently. Yeah, I mean, you said you're cold. Is anybody else cold? But are you always cold? Yeah. You don't count. <laughs> it's kind of like your dad used to not count when he was hot. Like, he didn't count. <laughs> All right, well, we're going to get started then. Um, I just want to open up a prayer. Father God, I do just come to you right now, and I thank you so much for your word. I thank you for this time and the season that you have us in. I thank you, God, just for for your blessing and, and for, um, for all that you're doing within us, God. I pray that we would just... Our hearts would be open, our minds would be open to, to hear your word and, and to be drawn deeper into, into love with you, God. And let this, let this be salt to, to our lips uh, this evening, God, and just draw us deeper and to, to seek and to, uh, to draw into you, Father. I pray that you just be with the kids as they're back learning. Um, I pray for just your grace and your spirit to move in the midst of them, Lord. In your holy name I pray, amen. Awesome. Well, I got to say, like, I'm, I'm excited about this whole teaching that we're going through, um, doing it, doing it this way. It's, I'm excited about it. It's fun to be able to kind of teach it like this, kind of partner with my brothers in this way. Um, but uh, also just with, it is that foundation that drew us into this in the first place. You know, when we first before we started the church, this was put, you know, the Lord brought this uh, to us. It was in 2008 when Mike Bickle first released this teaching. Um, and it was 2009 when we started. You know, it was like we got it like right off the press, like, as soon, like when he was teaching it. Um, and so, and it still tr- stands true. You know, what the beauty of it is, is like now, you know, since 2008, it's 14 years later. And now, like, I have 14 years of experience of trying to walk this out. Um, And and so my hope here is to kind of be able to to take that and and what he what he laid that foundation and just be able to, to speak from the experience as well of just having some time try you know walking this stuff out um so uh like i said i'm excited i think this is great i think it's perfect for um for who we are and just kind of reestablishing. if you've never been through the teaching um i'm i'm glad that we're doing it now um and it plays a big part in who we are as a body you know the first commandment i guess for me because it has been something that we've been familiar with for the past 14 years, it seems like it should be so common. But in reality, in the in most of the church, it probably isn't. You know, I, I know what we've been teaching, and I know the conversations I've been having for 14 years, but um, the fact of the matter is, I don't know that a whole lot of other people are really sharing this stuff. Um, but us as a body, our one of our main calls and assignments in at hop is to be a forerunner um part of the forerunner um ministry is a big thing of is like you go ahead of other people you're going to do something before the rest of the group the rest of the the bulk of people are and because of that you're going to stay smaller um you know there's been several words you know not to say that i don't think god will bring increase But it's a whole lot easier to move and make changes and to go into somewhere where nobody's been in a long time or ever uh, and for us to be able to go there as a small body. And that's very important uh, for us to be able to maintain that heart. This is where the first commandment really comes in as a forerunner is to maintain that heart of love. It's like we're not just doing this. We're not doing stuff just because it's different. Like, that is pointless and, and doesn't, if we were doing that, it, it would only be for our own, uh, you know, just to puff ourselves up because 
you're not doing it to get any accolades or any approval from any people you know and if we're not doing it for god then then it's just a waste of time um so you know i just want to encourage everybody in that the stuff the the sacrifices that you've made and that we've made the the changes the laying down of of traditions um of mindsets are um they're seen by God and it's part of our call as a forerunner, but it's also part of your act of love towards God, which is exactly what we're doing here. So I just, I want to just say I'm proud of the, what, what we've been doing, um, where we've been going, where the Lord has been taking us, um, what he's doing, reestablishing um, him, his, his ways back, back in the church. It doesn't matter. You know, I'm not, I'm not, I don't have to concern myself with the rest of, uh, of the church in America or anything else, all my focus is that we're obedient. That's the ultimate goal, and that's the ultimate goal with the first commandment is obedience. So, if you want to, we can go ahead and get started in this. And we'll just start with the introduction in, in numero uno one. Uh, that's going to be hard not to say numero uno, just <laughs> because it's Roman numerals. Um, but anyway, uh, okay, so God created us to love him in four spheres of our life, which includes our heart or our affections, our soul, which is our personality and expression, our mind, which is our intellect and thoughts, strength and our strength, which is our resources and influence, because he loves us this way. You know, a lot of this, I, I will say, just go ahead and get ready for repetition. You're going to hear a lot of the same verses. You're going to hear a lot of the same stuff repeated and it's for that purpose of like getting it in like we got to believe this stuff and we need to see it um so some of the same stuff that chan shared i'm going to share some of the same stuff i share josh is going to share you know we do that anyway on just about anything so um so just just beware just go ahead and set yourself up for that Mark 12, 30 says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. You know, that's set up by, you know, somebody asking Jesus, you know, what is the, what's the great commandment? What's, how do we do this thing, essentially? And so this is Jesus' response. Um, this is his answer to, like, on this and the second commandment, which we're not getting there yet. We're just starting with the first. On these two things, you hang the whole law. Jesus came. He didn't come to do away with the law. He came to fulfill it. You know, this that Jesus said and established is just as true today as it was back then. So, um, in this session, we're looking just to define kind of what those four spheres are and what that kind of looks like. So, I want to, Chan hit it the other day, but he just touched it. He just basically told you, that your mind is your thoughts, you know, like he didn't go real deep into it. Um, we want to dig a little deeper and then there will be another session where you're going to dig a little even deeper where it, it will be maybe just on your thoughts um, and on the mind, loving God with all the mind. So we're going to kind of build and, and go deeper and deeper and peel this onion back. So um, we're in at, at C and what does love look like? It's much more than sentiment or extravagant expressions in worship services. It's more than, than the feminized or sexualized versions that the world portrays. Love is loyal, it's faithful, it's protective, passionate, it's patient, selfless, it's honoring. It's everything in 1 Corinthians 13. You know, that's what we have to, part of this to, part of this teaching is to redefine for us what love is you know sometimes we can just get caught up in this element of you know of our own perceived idea of what love is but we need to come to the place of what what the word defines it as and the word is our is the one the true authority that can define it so um so we want to do, this is how we want to go about this. We're going to love God on God's terms. He's the one that gets to be the definer. Not us, not our own opinion, 
or or the way that the, that the world or anybody else or any other church, it's we're standing on the word and we're the way that God defines things. So there's many definitions of love, liberty, and freedom in our culture. And one of the core issues, and I, if you don't, like, this should be pretty evident, is, you know, in the age that we live and how love is defined, how f- freedom is defined. I mean, it should be easy. Chan talked the other day about what um, what they're doing to the whole transgender movement and this whole uh, gender ideology stuff that's going on. And they, they may do it in the eyes of love. You know, well, they love that person. They don't want to hold them back. But love is willing to be to be honest and tell people the truth that you don't just, you know, anything that you believe isn't true just because it's your truth. There, there are such things as absolute truths. And so that's, we have to make sure that we're willing to say that we live in a culture where it's not okay to say that, where you will get canceled, except I will say, if you're not on Facebook or any of those other things, they can't cancel you. So, uh, uh, so I, I'm, uh, I cancel myself for that reason, and therefore you cannot cancel me. So, um, no, nothing, bring, nothing more clearly brings the false views of love to the surface as in our view of salvation. You know, people want to believe that, you know, everybody can go, go to heaven. You know, you just got to be good. Um, you know, that your good outweighs your bad. And they, they don't want to think that a good person can go to, to, can go to hell. Um, there's a rap song that said there's only, that I, I listened to, and it's like, there's only been one person that's good. You know, and I'm like, and Jesus said, he said, you call me good. You call me good teacher. There's only one good. And he's talking about his father. And it's one of those, like, we got to realize that heaven is real hell is real and it doesn't matter how good you are apart from Jesus you're going to hell because you're still not good enough you know you can go through and and read some of this other stuff but talking about you know that God's definition of love does not involve accepting everyone with tolerance by abandoning his standards that's not true love You know, we have to be willing to hold those standards. That's true love. Our primary assignment, and this is something I remember going back and, and, you know, you get, people get saved or you get involved in church. It's, what is my calling? What's my position? Where do I belong? You know, and that's a lot of people's question. But the fir- your first assignment, your first calling is to the first commandment. You start there. The other, the other assignments you may get, they may come, you know, whether it's, you know, whether you have a position, an apostle, a pos- prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, you know, helps. Whatever you, it is, God may give you other assignments, worship, or it's just you get an assignment to a person. You know, those things aren't to be overlooked, but they're secondary to the first commandment. That This is our primary and, and should be, just as Jesus said, the first commandment. This is the, the first thing that we are to focus on. So, in, uh, we're at letter E. It says, all of God's commands bring with them the promise of his supernatural enabling to obey them. We must actively cultivate extravagant devotion to Jesus. But he gives us, this takes time and effort, but he gives us the grace to do it. When we set ourselves to do this, he's giving us that grace. He's going to empower us to love him. And at the end of it, what we're we're trying to do is we're wanting to ask is, what is the most God will empower me to give him? You know, can we ask ourselves that question? Can we ask him, like, Lord, how much will you let me give? How, you know, the mill miss you ever, so how abandoned will you let me be? So what is love? 
we're at, at Roman numeral three. There's four premises. Premise number one is that love requires the pursuit of obedience. John 14, 15 through 23, which I'll say, John 13 through 17, one of the most epic passages in the word. <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> Um, but starting in verse 15, uh, 14, verse 15 through 23, it says, Jesus is telling his disciples, says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And then he goes on in verse 21, he who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. Verse 23, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. This, this level of, of obedience, the pursuit of obedience is vital to our relationship with Jesus. Jesus defined loving God as being deeply rooted in a spirit of obedience. There's no such thing as loving God without seeking to obey his word. There's no such thing as, seeking to, as loving God without seeking to obey him. We can't, we can't make up our own stuff here, you know, and say, well, we love God. There's a lot of people that do that. Well, I love God but they love their view of God. They love who the, the God they've made in their own image. And, and what they do, their actions, they can make them up because the God that, they, that they're seeking isn't real. Love requires a wholehearted pursuit of obedience in both our attitudes and actions. And what is motivating our obedience? I think this is a key thing for me. And Chan hit on this. Uh, the other day um, he gave three things I added a fourth um, so we talked about he talked about fear based obedience which is obedience that's motivated, motivated by fear there's nothing wrong with that um, I'll, you know all of us have experienced fear based obedience you know, whether it's to God or to your parents or whoever it may be, you recognize there's consequences to your actions and you obey because you're afraid of the consequences. The next one is a duty-based obedience. We've all done it. It's like, okay, well, these are my responsibilities. These are my chores. You know, I'm not necessarily feeling it, but I'm going to do it anyway. You know, just because I have a sense of responsibility there. There's uh, people are counting on me. You know, so I'm going to go do it. I had the, the third one that I added is a reward-based obedience. It's doing something based because you have the realization there's a reward at the end of it. You know, we all recognize, and we do this when we work. It's like, you might not love your job. You might not like what you're doing. But you do it because you know at the end of the week or the month or every other week, you got a paycheck coming. And that feels pretty good. We love that thing. You know, we love the reward. We, you know, sometimes, you know, if you have, you know, we have that revelation. I, I want a, a deeper, greater revelation of the rewards that, that God wants to give us. You know, he says there's mansions in heaven. You know, he said that he, um, he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. You know, so sometimes we might be doing things for that reward. Nothing wrong with that. It's scriptural. But then no, the fourth one is the affection-based obedience. Now, I have a question for you. What do you think the first three have in common? The first three, they're, it's all about yourself. It's all about how it affects you. Every, like every bit of them. You know, whether it's fear, it's like, I'm afraid of the consequences and what I'm going to reap if I don't. The, you know, the duty, it's like, it's, my, it's just my sense of duty to do this. And if I don't, who else is going to do it? And you do it for your own self. The reward, you're doing it for your own reward. But the affection-based is no longer about yourself. This is about the one that you're obeying. And no matter what the consequences are from the obedience, you're willing to take them, whether it's reward or it's, it's repercussion. 
That's the whole thing. Because like, you got to look at the life of Jesus and what he did. He went to the cross for us with the full realization that he was about to get brutally beaten and crucified and ridiculed and, and take the full weight of the sin of every person's sin who has ever lived and took it upon himself. But he wasn't looking like he did it. He knew there was a reward at the end, but that wasn't his main purpose. It was for you. With that, that element of love, that's the way that he loved us. That's, that's the affection-based love, and he did it for his father. That it, doesn't, it didn't matter. He said, you know, he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's, and he's praying. And he said, Lord, if this cup can pass from me, then take it. Take it. But if it can't, then I'm willing. I'm here to do this thing for you. I'm here to do this thing for them because I love them. And it didn't matter anymore what was going to happen to him. That's where he can go and stand before Pilate and doesn't have to plead a thing. I know what's coming to me, and I'm, gonna, and I'm willing to take it all. That's the same love that he wants us to have towards him. You know, I've, I've shared this before. Uh, in the story of, of Peter, if you ever read in Fox's Book of Martyrs, there's the story of Peter. And, and I don't know if everybody's aware, but when he was martyred, when he was killed, he was crucified upside down. But there's a story. I don't know if it's 100% accurate or not. But what is told is that he is actually, he was told he was in the city. He was told that they're coming for him, and he was told to flee. So he went to flee and was out of, on his way out of the city. And then he has a vision of Jesus, or Jesus comes before him and is going back in. And, Jesus, and Peter's like, where are you going? And he's like, I'm going in. And, and so Peter turns around and goes back into the city, understanding of what was about to happen. But because he loved Jesus in, in such a way, knowing what was about to happen, it didn't matter. He was only leaving originally because his thought, well, you know, the people around him loved him. Like, hey, look, we don't want this to happen to you. We want you to stay with us. But at some point, Peter had to decide for himself, Jesus is going, and that's where he's calling me to. I'm following him. I don't care what the consequences are. This body doesn't mean anything. And a lot of the martyrs, if you read Fox's Book of Martyrs, they have that same mindset. That love, that extravagant, affectionate love that, does, that they will abandon their, their self completely for the sake of Christ. That's the kind of love that we're, that we're shooting for. That's the type of obedience that, that, we're long, that we're wanting to do. That it doesn't matter what other people think or say. That we're willing to give something up for him. We're willing to be... Uh, ridiculed, willing to be judged by the others around us. You know, we, we've got people, we live in a small community, and there's a lot of people that know us, and there's people that have views of our church. They've never been here. But they have views, and they, they can persecute us in our own heart because of decisions that we've made for righteousness because we felt like God has called us to do it. And it's worth it because I'm not doing it for them. Anything that I've laid down or given up, it hasn't been for the approval of men, and it can't be. It has to be seeking for this way to follow him and to be obedient. This affection-based love that flows from experiencing his affection for us and giving it back to him. It's the strongest and deepest and most consistent obedience. The others are good, and there's nothing wrong with them. And to be honest with you, I feel like in my own experience and and seeing people, it's like you don't you don't just get rid of fear-based obedience or duty-based. You don't. They're not. They're not progressive in the sense of like, oh, I've got through the fear. I'm no longer fearful. We you know, because we're humans and we're kind of complex, we kind of float back and forth. And so there's occasions where like, we may have two of them operating at the same time. I'm fearful of the consequences of my sin. And at the same time, I'm also doing something for the reward uh, of being, you know, it's, it's the whole 
what's that one uh, movie, Inside Out? And as the little girl gets, you know, she kind of gets older and they start, mi the colors of her little memory balls start mixing up. It's like, we have mixes in here on occasions. We're like, I'm fear-based, but I'm just doing this because it's my responsibility. But the ultimate goal is, is affection. You know, that's where we're going. It doesn't mean like the other ones are bad. Obedience is our goal. You know, it's like, let's seek to be 100% obedient. And if you, can, if you can have the full affection, then awesome. But if all you've got at the moment is some fear-based, then be obedient. That doesn't make it any less. You're still being obedient. God tells you to go pray for somebody in the marketplace or at work or whatever else. You might be a little fearful you know, or nervous. That's okay. When you go, you are obedient. And, and God sees that heart of you getting over that and pushing by those things. To, to, and, you, and there's reward for it. He's not judging us like, no, nah, that you didn't have full affection there. You know, he's he's ha he's he'll take your obedience. I'll take my kids' obedience, whether they did it because they were afraid of repercussion or they did it because they've like, oh, I'm super in love with dad at the moment. It's like I'll take them both. You know, this is what we call voluntary love. We choose to obey because we love him and we know it pleases him. This is that element of it's not about myself anymore. It's because it pleases him. I do it because it pleases him. This is the highest form of love we can give, and we only give it when we have the revelation of his love. This form of love is not concerned with self, but its primary focus is the Father. The other three forms of obedience are all motivated by its effects, how it affects you. And for me, it's like motives come into play here. You know, we can, we got to recognize that motives are very important. You can have two people doing the same thing with two different motives. And one has a reward and is in the right place and the other is wrong and in the wrong place. You know, and we have to be careful not to judge because we're not seeing those full motives. You know, when, when you give something up for the Lord, you fast or you like, I'm going to give up TV for the next year. You know, like if that's what you feel like the Lord's calling you to do, one person can say, oh, well, you're just being religious. But they don't recognize your heart that you, and why you're really doing that. And it's that's between you and the Father. Denying our lustful desires is the theater God chose for us to express our love to him. Each of us has a different struggle according to our personality and circumstances. Thus, we each have a different assignment from which we offer our gift of love to God. Saying no to sin gives us an opportunity to express our love to God. Anytime we say no, we resist the devil. We're saying yes to him. He's better. Some give God more time and money or in hopes that it's going to uh, uh, kind of make up for their compromise or their sin. And it doesn't work like that. So what God wants most is our response of love that is manifested in seeking to obey his word. All of Jesus' commands are all related to love. For example, he commands us to stay near, near to his heart to seek his face, to choose love over lust, to receive eternal rewards, and to be vessels of love to others by blessing and serving them. Premise number two, love includes adoring trust. In Revelation 5, 9 says, You are worthy, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God, or you proved your relationship and love by your blood out of every tribe and nation. When it comes to that area of trust, it's like we do have to trust him. Uh, when I had I had LASIK surgery a little over a year ago, 
And one of the things when you go and I can do something, I can't really any surgery or anything like that. It's like you're going and you're trusting that that person knows what they're doing. <laughs> you know, it's like, and at some point it's like, I, I have no more control over this. Like I have to fully let go and just follow you. Like whatever you tell me to do, you know, like, because they're literally like, they're like holding your head. They're like, be still, don't move, don't blink, don't do it. And it's like, it's very important because if you do something that they're not wanting you to do, it can be detrimental to your eyesight. That's the same way that, that, God, that God is wanting us to love is like, put your full self in my hands and fully trust me and let me lead you and guide you. And I'm going to keep you safe this entire time. You're going to be, I'm going to keep you in, uh, in my hands. Doesn't mean there won't be difficulty. There won't be trials. I mean, literally, he led Peter, you know, my, that example, he led Peter to his death. But that was his will. That's, he brought, he got glory and honor out of that. Jesus isn't always looking to, to make us last longer. He's looking for us to be obedient. And he, God, is, God has all the money and all the time and everything else. We feel like more of us is going to make it better. And that's not exactly true. It's more of God. We have to be willing to fully trust and let it go. Let go of our control. Adoration and gratitude to Jesus for his greatness and kindness is essential to love. It is foundational to Paul's theology of holiness and love. With awestruck, grateful love, we adore Jesus and trust his wisdom, humility, and power. He is the most deserving and capable person to rule our life and the whole earth. The whole earth. I mean, that's what he's coming back for. He's going to set up his rule and reign, which we have, we can only imagine what that's really going to be like because we've never seen anybody do it. I think I've heard Danny say this before of uh, talking about exactly how it goes now at the moment but talking about like a servant a servant that is under the rule of a, of a perfect master is completely free because they can trust every decision that that master makes they know it's going to be good and it's going to be right but when we you know we live in a society that is you know God uses broken men and you know they make poor decisions sometimes um, our nation is reaping the benefit of that right now but that's we're, we're not trusting in the men in that regard we're, we're putting our place in, in that place of Jesus so he's that perfect he's going to come and establish himself as that perfect leader where we can fully trust his full like imagine what the world's going to be like like I just have no like I can only imagine but I feel like it's going to be better than I really can think of. So, We often take the wealth of God's kindness so lightly because our long history of sin, we deserve God's wrath, which is true. Uh, Romans 2, 4 says, Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Love grows in us as we are moved by the truth of Jesus' greatness and by gratitude in seeing the whole story of how he is treating us. The psalmist had an overflowing heart of adoration for the indescribably loveliness of Jesus. Psalm 45, verses 1 and 2, My heart is overflowing with a good theme. I recite my composition concerning the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer, for you are fairer. Like, these are these this element of gratitude and trust is something that we must have in our relationship. It's a way that we show that we truly love him is by trusting him, putting it in his full putting it fully in his hands. All right, we're at premise three. It's letter C. Love requires loyalty to truth. Confidence in Jesus' perfect wisdom. Loyalty to truth. True love expresses loyalty to God's word instead of yielding to fear of man. Uh, 
you know, that's kind of what I was talking about earlier, the decisions that we've made and some of the things that I've made and talking to, I remember having a big kind of throwdown with a family member and it, it, it was, I have to be faithful to truth, to the truth of the word and the truth of Jesus. And it doesn't, um, and I'm not yielding just because I respect you, but I, my love for Jesus is greater. I have to be obedient to him first. In the end times, there will be a battle for truth as some believers give heed to doctrines of demons that promote lies about Jesus. We can see that in our in our nation today and in the stuff that's going out. The lies and the truth, just the, the sheer um, opposition to the word truth. Well, that's your, that's your truth, but it's not mine. And that... <laughs> You know, there's people that believe that there is no there is no absolute truth. But if that was a true statement, how can that be true? You know, we have to understand that, like, if there is no absolute truth, then that statement can't be true. Unless there is only one absolute truth, that there is no absolute truth. You know, that's what they kind of want to lead towards. But that doesn't work either. Love for God is loyalty to, to his truth as seen in Jesus. Our love must be expressed in alliance with the Jesus of the Bible, not the Jesus of humanist sentiment, not the, the Jesus we make up in, in our own image. Um, the Holy Spirit will glorify and exalt Jesus by guiding us into all truth about him. The Word tells us the Holy Spirit is sent to, to lead us in all, all truth and reveal all things to us. Premise number four. Love includes consuming desire. Love sick and abandonment to God. Song, the Song of Solomon 5 verse 8 says, if you, love, if you find my beloved, tell him I'm love sick." Love is not passive, but includes burning desire. To be lovesick for God means we seek to love Jesus more than anything else. Being wounded with love is to be sick or pained with desire for more of Jesus and, f and for removing all compromise that hinders love for him. Because, you know, those things that we got to recognize that sin or compromise does put distance between us. It's really what our full, our, our full trust and abandonment brings us closer to him. If you draw near to me, I'll draw near to you. We're seeking to draw near. God is love. He burns as an all-consuming fire of jealousy. This one some people don't like. I remember hearing a story about Oprah who got offended because the word said that God was jealous. And she didn't want to serve a God that was jealous. And to be honest, I don't think that's true. I mean, it's like love is jealous. Although I will say in the NISB, I was reading in 1 Corinthians 13. And in the way this translated, it says love, like love is kind, love is patient. It said it is not jealous. But, you know, most of the other translations don't use that word. I was like, oh, that was interesting. I'm like, how does... How did, they use, how did they translate that? Just so you know, when you read this, if you read an NASB and it says love is not jealous, but then the word says God is love, but also his name is jealous, um, those kind of end up contradicting. So I'm not exactly sure how they translated that. Um, and there wasn't, even though this is a study Bible and it has much the strongs in it, it didn't give the number for that word. And I was like, that's interesting. I'm like, oh, I don't know about you. <laughs> uh, I, wasn't, I wasn't too fond about that. So just be aware. <laughs> uh, so because he is a jealous God, you know, it's like that would be something is wrong with the husband if he's not jealous for his wife if she's going spending time with another man. There's something wrong there. That's not love. He 
He wants to take over our life and to consume us from the inside out, dominating our affections, thoughts, and words as he determines our destiny and establishes our eternal greatness and joy. Just imagine, you know, it's like, oh, we want, you know, there's this thing in our culture of, you know, I make my own destiny, you know, or we have our own, our own vision for our life. But if God truly is who he says he is, and we can truly fully trust him, and he is a perfect master, we're much better off choosing his way than our own. I think it's in Proverbs where it says, where it talks about, you know, a man chooses his way, you know, but, but God establishes his steps. You know, it's like we could choose our way all day long, but really it's God who can establish it, who can make us more than what we really are and even think that we want to be. The God who has everything wants us because he is love. Love is not toleration, but desire. The God who, that's a good one. Love is not toleration, but desire. It's not, I'm just, I'm not just tolerating. He's not just tolerating us. And we're not just supposed to be tolerating him and coming in to church because of duty or something along that lines. But we're to be, we're to desire him. The God who has everything still wants something. Why? Not because he's needy, but because he is the fountain of desire. Desire implies want, but not lack. God wants the one he loves without lacking anything. God doesn't need you, but he wants you. He wants you. He can use anybody. You know, he created the heavens and the earth. He created man out of dust. It's like he could do things without us, but he wants to do things with us. It's humbling, but also exciting. It's like he wants to do things. He's, he's willing to, to work with us and, and go through these things with us. And Jesus wants to reveal himself then more, more than just our Savior our forgiver, healer, provider, but that he's our jealous bridegroom God, our king. There's, there's, there's deeper levels to him that we can go. Jesus beckons us into abandonment. He says, take up your cross and follow me. Leave it, leave it all behind. Say goodbye to houses and lands for my sake. This is the voice of the bridegroom. I looked at, I was talking to Rachel about this the other day. Um, where we've been watching The Chosen with the kids, and they've really been enjoying it. And so there's, um, there was an episode we were watching the other day where Jesus is, te- he tells Peter to go ahead. Like they're kind of picking up camp, fixing to leave, going back into Capernaum, and he tells Peter, go ahead, you know, go see your wife and, and your mother in law. And, but Peter's kind of like, well, what about all these guys? I got to take care of them, you know? <laughs> Uh, and he's like, yeah, but they all don't have family like you do. And, and so he sends them off, sends them off. And then Peter's there and he's talking to his wife and she is proud of him and excited for, because of she recognized Jesus called him and that she knew what he was doing. And the time that he was spending away from her that who she recognized who he was doing that for, who he was really with. Like, that's very important, like, just to see, to recognize, like, people really did that. Like, when Jesus there, like, they left everything. They left what they knew, their, their jobs, their careers, what they were going to do for the rest of their life and laid it down and just straight up walked away from it. And that wasn't just the disciples. I mean, there's instances in the Old Testament. There's instances from from then till now of people doing that exact same thing. And, you know, stories of the Moravians and them selling themselves into slavery just to take the gospel to people that were slaves. That's abandoned love. That's the, the bridegroom calling out and they're abandoning everything because they love him. We can love with that same passion. Doesn't mean you need to go sell yourself to slavery. It's not what I'm saying. You got to be obedient. They were called there.
Okay, so we're going to get into, we're in Roman numeral four. The first sphere is our loving God with all our heart or our affections, our emotions. The heart speaks of our emotions, affections, longings, the very impulse of desire that affects every decision we make. The heart is hidden current uh, is the hidden current that moves our inner man. Our heart has powerful emotions that color the way we see everything and defines our core reality and drives all that we do. Proverbs 4:23 says, "Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life." This is an assignment from God is to keep your heart with all diligence. We can set our love or affections on anything that we choose. Our emotions eventually follow whatever we set ourselves to pursue. You know, we get into, you know, we have the heart, soul, mind, and strength, and there's elements of where, you know, the heart, they, they're, they're interconnected within each other because it's like, well, you can, your heart can be determined by your mind and what you set your mind on. And then... And that bleeds into, and then that comes out of your soul and in, in the way that in your expressions. And that affects the decisions that you make for your resources and your strength. You know, all these things are tied together. And you're, you know, it's going to be hard. You're probably not going to be able to do something with the emotions with minus your mind. I will say, like, the way I was thinking about this earlier and the way that the, that it put, the word puts that God put soul in between mind and heart. And I think part of that is because, you know, a lot of times we think, you know, our expressions and that comes from our mind and our thoughts, our speech, you know, is what our soul comes from our mind. But if you've ever prophesied or done anything, it kind of bypasses the mind completely and it comes from somewhere else. So it comes from low, you know, like from either down here or just shoot straight past it and it's right out your mouth. Like, those instances, it's like God used your soul, he used your speech, and he used your expression without necessarily using your mind in the moment because your spirit was speaking. Those are just interesting things I was thinking about earlier today. So um, so we can set our love. We can set our affection. We can, it's, it's a choice that we can make. It's all a choice. You know, we live in a nation with, with divorce rates that are very high or where they shouldn't be. And I, I've worked in a field in the fire department where the divorce rate was like 70%. Like then when I got there, they told me everybody gets divorced. And I'm like, that, you know, then there's one guy there who he hadn't been married long, but he was like, don't have to be that way. He's a Christian guy. And I agreed with him. But at the same time, it wasn't worth staying there and testing it out. <laughs> it's like, I don't like this job. I don't like this job that much, you know? Like, uh, so, but we have to make that choice. We have to choose to continually love our spouse. To, we, we have a choice to make, continually to love our kids, to continually to love God. We have to continue to make this a, a pursuit. 1 Corinthians 13, go back and read it. At the end of it, it says, pursue love. Pursue it. And, then it, and it says, and desire spiritual gifts. It's like there's things that we should die, desire, but there's one thing that tells us to pursue, and that's love. Psalms 18, verse 1 says, I will love you, O Lord, my strength. You know, this is where we want to be able to find our delight. But it has to come from that choice that we're going to set our affections. I know Chan shared on it the other day about David. He's like, I will love you. That's, that's the mindset. That's what we, we have to do. Sphere number two our soul, our personality, our expression. That God wants us to love him with all of our soul, with the animation, with our words and our speech. I'm not necessarily the most animated person. You know, I'm a little more stoic in that sense. But my wife, on the other hand, she makes up for me. 
So, uh, but God is asking us to love him with all of that. You know, I think of David again in this regard. He's like, maybe David might not have been super expressive, but God called him. He's like, go dance for me. You know, in the med- you know, rip off his garbs or his outer garment, and just dance and through the streets while they're slaughtering bulls and stuff in front of him, which is a crazy picture. But it's like he abandoned himself for the sake of God to show his love and to love him with that, with that full expression that he saw it. You know, this is David, the guy that, Jesus, that God said, he's a man after my own heart. We, sometimes we, we have to be willing to lay that down, like what our view of ourselves is and express ourselves different. I know Danny's really kind of pushed some people and challenged some people. And probably I think some people have left because they did get challenged to actually express themselves for God. But really God's asking for that. He's like, will you be abandoned? Will you look like a fool for me? Paul said, you know, I will take everything that I've ever been taught who was a very well-trained and pretty well-off person. I will take it and lose it all for the, for the sake of knowing Christ. That's where we have to be and for that expression. Roman numeral number six. Third sphere, our mind, our intellect, our thoughts. So we love with all of our, with all of our mind fill our minds with long and loving meditation of God's word and resist putting anything in our mind that diminishes love for Jesus and quenches the spirit. We, ca- we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. 2 Corinthians 10, 5. Sometimes I feel like that's like, that's a hard one because it's like the mind is, it never stops. It's always on. We're always thinking. But at the same time, that's all that opportunity to love him. You have every moment of every day to make a choice to love him. You know, because you might be sitting at your desk. You know, I, I work at home and I sit at a desk, but I have, you know, nobody can see me. So the expression, like, you know, I'm not, I'm not really worried about you know, what, what I look like, but there is an opportunity to like, to really show my love in the thought process and in the way that we do things, you know, like doing things with excellence in a way that you're doing it, not just to be not in a sense of perfection, but do it in the sense of I'm doing everything that I do as unto the Lord. I want to do it to bring him glory and to bring him honor. That, that place comes from that, that mind. We have to make that conscious decision to, to do that. We have every moment of every day, you know, where, uh, where we can be making those, those choices to take every thought captive, uh, to bring it under into the, uh, to make it obedient to Christ. That can seem hard. But eventually, it gets easier and it gets better. And the more that you are able to think on him and meditate on his word, that becomes, that becomes where your mind automatically goes. You know, it's not like you're not having to try and make yourself do it. It's like, oh, I'm just already there. Much of our life occurs in our mind because we can never turn it off. Our mind defines so much of who we are and how we love. God's word equips us to think first and most naturally about God. To love God with our mind is a powerful possibility. But it's not going to happen by chance. And in all honesty, none of it's going to happen by chance. You know, we love, you know, I mentioned earlier, we can set ourselves to love and where we put our, you know, we can choose what we put our affections on. That, that's a constant choice. Everything is a choice of ours. And if 
if we just want to just uh, l- assume that that stuff's going to happen, we're gravely mistaken. You know, we might not be completely overtaken by the world, but there will be enough in you that you will be ineffective in your walk with the, with the Lord. So number four, our strength, our resources, our influence, our time, money, talents, reputation. The things that we're willing to give up for him. You know, the word tells us, you know, the tithing is uh, one of the only things that comes with a promise it's like, you know, or like a test. He's like, try me in this. That's really one of the only times that God, the, that he's like, try me, test me. You know, we, when we tithe that there is, I can't afford not to, you know, I want God's blessing on my money, you know, and it's not worth the risk of like not tithing. So we give our money. Sometimes it's like we give, Lord leads us to give more than a tithe. Maybe it's, call it whatever it is, your whole savings. But does a, but I've, a lot of the stories and the things that I've heard, I don't know that I've ever heard one where somebody was like, I gave that one time and God never gave it back. I don't think I've ever heard of a story where God never gave it back. Plus some. Now he does it in his own timing. Shoot, the company that I work for, Luke and Cheryl, who started it, they gave a lot. And there may be a time frame there where they felt like they weren't getting anything back. But then did the Lord bless them? You know, I don't think their their business was just a happen chance or just because Cheryl was really good at, at Amazon business. I think there was a blessing on it. So this, these are areas, our talents. Sometimes it's laying them down and not using them for the world. Our world wants to promote itself. And there's a, a huge push for it with the whole social media stuff and YouTube and everything else. And that's how people make their living nowadays. But maybe the Lord's like, nope, hold it back. You're going to go hide away in a, uh, at this little church in, in Kemper County. jump down to the last thing. We're almost done. Loving God with our all. This is the thing about about this and with God is all he's asking for is all. That's it. You know, that's all it is. But it's very simple. He's like, I don't, I'm not asking you to do math. You know, I know, I know better than that. He's like, I just give me all of it. That's all it is. He's like, I just want all. You know, we got to realize that all is all. It doesn't matter. He's not asking for volume. He's not asking, it doesn't matter how big that all is. You know, Jesus gave the example of, you know, in he, he sees the woman who gives her last two pennies. And then this other dude, this rich guy who goes and gives a tithe, he, it didn't affect him at all. Jesus said, who gave more? You know, the natural thing is that dude did. 
you know like absolutely he gave more she, she didn't give she gave two cents you know but it was all that she had that's all that God's looking for that's what he's looking for when we're giving and the word is clear there it's laid out in the old testament through it, that he doesn't want the leftovers or he doesn't want the secondary thing he wants all of you he doesn't and, and when we don't give him all when we hold back we're holding back from ourselves because he's willing to meet us with that but when we hold back that 10 percent, that two percent that's the last two percent if you want to go down to verse c it says or letter c power in our life is found in pursuing hundredfold obedience there are powerful dynamics that occur in our heart when we soberly seek to walk in total obedience the 98 percent pursuit of obedience has a limited blessing that two percent is limiting the blessing that you can receive That last 2% positions us to live with a vibrant heart. Reaching for full obedience for decades is the definition of living radically before God. There's other stuff for you to read in here. Y'all can go through it. But I, I do just want to encourage. This is God, what God's doing in, in Hop. This is what he's wanting to see in each of our lives, he's asking for all. He's asking for all of your heart, all of your affections, your emotions. And that may, that sounds like a lot. But think about who you're entrusting it to. A perfect master. A perfect husband. You can fully trust. He's asking for all your soul. He's wanting you to be willing to look like a fool at times, to hold back at times. He's, he's wanting you to put a, bri a bridle on your speech for his sake. To watch not just, uh, not just what we say, but how we say it. Because that matters. You know, we, we say something really nice with wicked intent. He sees the intent. He's wanting all of our mind, our thoughts. We have every moment of every waking day to love him with our mind. You have opportunity all day long. You don't have to go and look for it. You, you know, there's nothing wrong with going like, hey, I want to go witness to some folks or I want to go see if I can find somebody I can give some money to or something else. Nothing wrong with that. But you have every moment of every day to choose to love him. He's wanting all of your strength. He's wanting you to be willing and able to, to lay it down. Jesus lives 33, 30 years hidden. Nobody knows who he is just to, to, to have a three-year ministry and die on the cross. John the Baptist, 18 years in the, in the wilderness for 18 months of a ministry. He's not, he's, he doesn't care. He's not that concerned with how long it lasts. He's concerned about your obedience. And that's what's the most successful. That's what he determines as success. Were you obedient? Doesn't, the world's definition and God's definition are not the same. The word tells us that, that, that people look at the outward appearance of things, but God looks at the heart. We have to recognize that God is looking at our heart that everything that we do and all the decisions that we've made and the stuff that we've laid things down for, God's seen the heart and it doesn't matter what other people think. Being a forerunner, people are going to think you're weird because why are you walking straight into the woods and there's no trail there? Nobody's ever been there. Why do it? Because God told me to. He said, walk right in between those two trees. Okay. I... Y'all stay here. I'm willing to go. That's why we're doing it. That's, 
the, the fruit of, a, of the first commandment. That's even though we haven't been teaching this every month and every, every day, every time we come, and it's not mentioned all the time, but the things that has been happening in this church has been from that. From that dedication, from, from Danny and Courtney going to a One Thing conference and making that commitment that the ministry that they're starting, that God set them on, is going to be committed to this. And you don't have to say it all the time in order to do it. So, with that being said, that's still our focus. That's still what we're doing. It's never stopped. It's never got off of there. So I just encourage you, look for those opportunities. You don't really have to look very far. I mean, really, like, just, just open your eyes. It's like, just close your eyes. Maybe you just need to think. Uh, but just make the choice. Let's pray. Father God, I do thank you for your word. I thank you for this call. I thank you for the encouragement, God, that you want us to love you and that you love us this way. God, that you were so passionate and you loved us so much that you took the, the beating that you did, that you took the ridicule, that you took the scars, you took the, the nails for me. You took the full weight from a, of that judgment from the Father for me. God, and it's our duty, it's my duty to love you in that same way. It's my, uh, my debt, but also my great reward to love you that way. Lord, and I, I do thank you so much for this. I thank you for this time, this season, what you're doing. In your holy name I pray, amen. I do want to remind everybody, if there's stuff in the back, on the table in the back, if it's yours, please take it home.